good evening, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday, December 6, 2022, Board of Education meeting. Uh, can we stand for the pledge, please? Megan, would you like to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Bystrack to give us his superintendent report. Great, thank you, Ms. Gates. Appreciate it. Welcome to everyone and to everyone at home watching. And to uh, we have a handful of pig students here too that are getting credit for their end of the semester class. So welcome to all of our pig students. Um, just a few things, I guess I'd like to note. Uh, first of all, I hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving. I just want to send uh, a sincere note of appreciation to our buildings and grounds department. I don't know if anybody noticed, but we got a little bit of snow around here just before Thanksgiving. Uh, as we drove around the district the following you know, few days after that, it was unbelievable uh, just how quickly they were able to clear things. Not safe enough. We couldn't get a lot of our emergency exits open. And believe it or not, some of our equipment actually was damaged by the weight of the snow. Uh, but we had people here the entire weekend working through this and just trying to clear out uh, you know, the snow to make sure that it was safe for our kids, our parking lots. Uh, I mean, within a few days, uh, we're cleared up and looking good. So just a big shout out to our buildings and grounds department uh, for making that happen. It's truly appreciated. So a uh, few things here, uh, just in relation to that, too, we had a few snow days, uh, obviously, as well. So every year we budget uh, a few snow days. This year, I believe we actually have three in the calendar extra. So I have gotten a few questions. Uh, do these does this mean we're out of snow days because we had three emergency closure days so the count uh, the, well, the state really was in a state of emergency so essentially those those don't count as snow days so we still have our three snow days we still have all of our snow days right now so that was clarified for us well i'm sure everybody's happy to hear that we didn't use them all up in november um so this is buffalo folks we may need a couple more later on um so that's good news there uh, also, I just wanted to take a moment just to remind anybody that might be tuning in or in the room here, too. We have a community forum on Thursday night. Uh, we're going to be over at East Senior High School at 7 o'clock if anybody's able to be there. If not, uh, we're also going to be live streaming this event as well, and we're going to record it and put it on the website. Uh, this event is actually, we're, we're working to, uh, we've been working on a redistricting process. So uh, we just did a video uh, a couple of days ago, or actually last week, just to kind of explain what that means. Uh, we're still relatively early on in the process, though, folks. So, you know, the Board of Education, really just for anybody watching, is just soliciting feedback from the community. I said this at the last board meeting. I think it was uh, Board of Education can just go ahead and change things, but our board has chosen to actually find out kind of how people are feeling and what people's thoughts might be. And they're using a variety of forums. Uh, the community forum that's happening over at East Senior on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, there's also been surveys that have been sent out to staff and families. There have been focus groups with staff and families. We have on our website, there's a link, a redistricting feedback link. If anybody has any thoughts, go ahead, click on that. You can enter whatever it is. Uh, and we're not done yet. We're going to continue to seek out some more feedback. You know, ultimately, from a process standpoint, we have a, identified a key group of individuals, and we're going to go forward on Thursday night and be able to identify you know, who's, kind of who's helping out. But it's a diverse stakeholder group from around the community. There's educators, you know, principals, you've got teachers, you've got parents, you've got people representing students that, uh, you know, parents that uh, students that have disabilities, uh, our ENL community, I mean, just our business community. We really tried to find a well-rounded, balanced group of individuals to be able to get together and just have some dialogue, uh, look at some data, uh, and just be able to make some decisions. We are a little skewed with some of our population. We haven't gone through looking at attendance zones in a little while. So, I mean, I can be honest with you, when I was in high school back, you know, a couple of years ago, I remember we went through the process, but, you know, I don't think it's happened too many times since then. So it's really something, it's a normal uh, process that really any school district that has, you know, more than one elementary, more than one middle and more than one high school has to go through at some point or another just to be able to take a look. So there are no predetermined decisions at this point. We're really just uh, in the exploratory phase. So uh, I'm just putting that out there. Obviously, our board is aware of this, but I'm just putting this out there because this is a good venue. I've got a microphone. I want to make sure people understand, you know, the process that we're in right now. So Mr. looking Patrick, forward to that. Can you clarify Please. what's going to occur at the forum for folks so they understand Absolutely. why they, why should I be attending this? That's the first part, the why. <laughs> okay, so really what is redistricting? 
why is it that we feel the need to, to engage in this process. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about that process. We're going to talk about some of the folks, like, as I just did, about their, uh, the core team, as we're calling them. They're kind of getting together to have some of this discussion. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some, uh, we'll talk about some feedback that we've got. We've solicited quite a bit of feedback, so we think it'd be important to share some of that feedback with our community. Um, we're also going to be talking a little bit about some of the factors that you take into consideration when you engage in a redistricting process. You know, it's not as simple as just moving students around a district. You really have to take a look at what kind of educational programming is needed. You know, for instance, you might have students that require to, uh, services in a smaller classroom setting, or uh, you might have speech services that have to be delivered, and you can't, can't just do that in, you know, in a parking lot. You have to have dedicated space for some of these things. Transportation is a big part of it as well. You need to be able to have efficient transportation routes uh, so that people, you, know, you minimize the amount of time that people are on school buses. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that are taken into consideration. Um, you know, in addition to you want some balance. Um, you know, not, you know, some of the feedback that we've been getting early on, you know, says that you know people do value uh, some degree of having kids kind of going to school in their own neighborhoods as opposed to having to drive past a school to to get that, which is a configuration that we have at the current moment. So, um, you know, and that'll also be an opportunity too. I was just talking with Mr. Pacer, who does all the videotaping for us and live streaming. Uh, well, I, I have an opportunity for people to ask some questions as well. So. Uh, you know, and we'll have somebody taking some notes there. And again, it's just another opportunity to be able to communicate, talk a little bit about the process to your point, Mr. Vanderlip, but also solicit some additional feedback that we have. So uh, we're working with a group called PLC Associates. They've done this kind of work around the state before, uh, and they are going to help us to share some of the feedback that we've gotten thus far. There's some themes that are starting to emerge in terms of people's overall feelings about, you know, where the kids go to school and what sort of programming and how we can figure things. So um, I'm looking forward to a good conversation Thursday night, but I'm looking forward to just a good process moving forward. And if there's one final thing, just to talk a little more process, uh, we do, if you go to our website, we, we have a timeline on there. Timeline is really it's be, so we can set some, some targets and goals. One of the things it says, though, we'll implement something in September. Very possible that we could, but ultimately we're not going to let a, you know, the calendar dictate how things move forward. Ultimately, the time, for time and I said this in my video that I, I did last week, sorry, it was eight minutes long. Um, I think this is a slightly longer conversation, but we are, if it needs to take a little longer than that, it can. Uh, but we want to let really the, the sort of the, some of the feedback that we're getting, and then ultimately our board members, you know, make decisions that are going to be what's in the best interest for our kids. So, you know, we, we have that up there as kind of a target date. It is flexible, so we can we can do what we need to do, and it's also possible to phase in changes as well. So, too, it doesn't have to be flip a switch and everything happens at once. If there's a decision that's made for how something is going to be rolled out, it can be all right. Phase one is this, phase two is that. So, we want to do what's best for the kids. Thank so, you. Sure. And if I could just say one final thing, this, it seems strange, but this is our last board meeting before the holiday break, so I just want to miss, wish everyone, miss everyone, wish everyone a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, so. Thank you. Um, one last quick question on that. If you sure. can't make it right at 7 o'clock, can you, is it the forum set up where people can kind of join in? And that, yeah, it's just, it's in the auditorium. Done. Yeah, we're going to finish up probably sometime between 8.30 and 9 o'clock for the evening, but yeah, absolutely. And again, it's going to be live streamed, so if somebody was not able to make it, uh, or let's just even say they couldn't watch the live stream at that time, we'll also have it saved on the, the website as well. as a dedicated page on our website, so people can come back and, and watch that as well. So yes, it's, it's a free-flowing sort of don't need to be there right at 7 o'clock, you know, so. Appreciate that. Sure. Any other questions on that? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. All right. I just have a short board um, president report. I just want to, I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I'd also like to extend our sincere appreciation to our buildings and grounds crew for their amazing job clearing out our parking lots, driveway, entrances, and exits. Thank you so much for your hard work. Um, at our last... I'm sorry, at our last meeting, our district office and various members of our staff gave us a wonderful board appreciation. And I just wanted to thank everyone again for, for that and everyone who was involved. The videos and presence were truly touching and our board was extremely grateful. And in those moments, you know, we just feel so proud to serve this community. So I want to thank everyone again. Um, our concerts and holiday events are flooding our calendar, so we hope to see you there. And once again, our community forum is this Thursday, East Senior, 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. And if not, we wish you all a wonderful holiday season, and we'll enjoy your time off. We'll see you in January.
Ms. Gates, can I just bring up one more thing too? A number of board members had just mentioned, I thought it was worth kind of bringing up, just a thanks to anybody from the towns watching too. Uh, given the fact there was a big fire last Christmas uh, at the highway department and all the, uh, the you know, some of our plows and equipment the town were lost. I think they did a phenomenal job in clearing out uh, the roads as well. I know a number of board members had, had mentioned that and I just thought it was worth mentioning. In case anybody from the town's watching, thank you very much. So. <laughs> thank you. All right, so we are going to move on to our assistant superintendent's reports. Um, Dr. Cervoni, are you ready to come up? All right. Okay. Hello. Hi, good evening. Nice to see everyone. Uh, packed house. Love it. Um, just a, a few brief updates of what's happening in my world. I uh, was at a great meeting actually today with our senior clerks in, across, uh, across the district. And uh, they began meeting again regularly uh, as a group and invited me in and we were able to talk a little bit about um, their use of our new attendance system, uh, some of the trials and tribulations of their work as it relates to human resources, uh, securing subs, the preferred building subs. Uh, and it was great just to go back and forth and talk about things that they have really found to be working very well for them and uh, things that maybe they could use help with or ideas that they might have on uh, different reports that we could run or different ways that we can implement uh, or communicate differently. Uh, being a department head now and a building principal, I mean, our senior clerks, they, they keep the ship going. and. Uh, they have such a, a, a unique perspective and a pulse on, on our operations and our buildings and such. So uh, it was great. I, it was uh, a pleasure to be invited there and um, I thought some great dialogue. So um, just a great group that we have. Uh, another thing that I'm currently working on is our APPR agreement. Uh, we have uh, some obligation to uh, update our APPR agreement because we recently uh, uh, negotiated a new teacher contract last year. So nothing uh, major changes. We have some obligations to update it based on some new regulations. So it's a group effort. There is, uh, WISTA has an APPR uh, member, a committee um, that meets, and then so do our administrators. So all three of all three groups met, myself and both the WISTA and our administrative group, uh, as we did years ago when APPR was first implemented uh, upon us and just talked about um, some of the changes that we may have to make or adjustments uh, to make sure that we are approved by the state. And we have until like March to do this and we knew this was coming. So um, really productive uh, meeting. Uh, I don't think anything that necessarily would be any major changes or alarms. We're still kind of have our fingers crossed that eventually we'll see some serious relief with APPR um, uh, with some of the elections behind us now. So we're still hoping that that's coming and some more local control. But in the meantime, we still have some obligations that we have to uphold. So. Uh, it's been a very good collaborative process. So, I think that's that's it for me for now. Okay. Any so does that impact that impact APPR for next school year? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, depending on the changes we make, some of those may go into effect this year. Uh, how it would affect our teachers would probably actually. Um, eliminate some of the work and some of the SLO things that we have to do depending on different grade levels what we ultimately decide upon so we work collaboratively as a group and then we'll have to develop an MOA with our teachers and our administrators make sure that we're all in agreement with it and then I will work with John Delbert our CIO to implement that into our portal for our district and then ultimately state approval so uh, it is uh, some of those changes could impact us this year by impact, uh, it's, it's relatively insignificant. It might just eliminate us having to, you know, enter some final scores in our SLOs because we might go to a, a more global perspective uh, district measure. So it might actually simplify some things. At least that's where we're trending. But we just had one meeting, so uh, we're meeting again right after the holidays and then a couple times after that. But great progress at our first meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. There's some action on that in Albany, too, with the legislators. Yeah, that's what we like to hear. I, we were hoping earlier, but then I think it got paused okay. with the election. And yeah, we're working on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. um, is Mrs. Fowler available to come up? Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. 
Um, I have a couple updates as well. One um, update is something that's exciting and we are very excited to have our newly reopened or newly opened Community Resource Center over at Ebenezer. Our Community Resource Center is a new fresh space that houses our expanded um, district clothes closet as well as our district resource center. So we, we call it that resource center because it also includes um, additional opportunities and additional items for folks in our community that may need them. Some of those items include personal hygiene products um, as well as anything else you know in terms of um, resources or availability of food pantries or other things that are in the area our district social workers are an instrumental part of that as well as our community outreach social worker um, who has both day and evening hours that it is open as well as able to make um, personal appointments for families if those times don't work or if there's other opportunities um, that maybe our district outreach social worker can meet someone somewhere else maybe bring some of those resources to them all of the information is available on our website it is a new like I said freshly painted uh, reorganized centralized location um, and we are really excited to have that opportunity available to anyone in our community our district social worker also is there for anyone who needs resources to any community organizations or community agencies, as well as any um, counseling referrals or anything that, that can be made available to any of anyone in our, in our community. Um, so really excited about that. That's been kind of a, um, an opportunity for us and really looking at having as many people take advantage of it as, as possible. Um, we also want to talk a little bit about, we did one of our um, community forums a few, about a week or so ago with Dr. Stephanie Frederick from the UB Alberti Center, um, focusing on kind of bullying, abuse, and prevention. And the Alberti Center through UB is pretty well known. Um, and we had her do our presentation. We live streamed it as well as recorded it, and it is now available on our website. So the presentation provided an overview on technology, um, social media use among children and teens, with a focus obviously on cyberbullying. And specific strategies were shared, resources were made available, and all of that is available on our website um, for those who were unable to attend, or even if you want to just kind of look on there and see what might be available. Um, Again, our district social workers can certainly help if there is an issue that's happening or that you're not sure, or certainly we don't want to reach out to anyone at our buildings to be able to support families through that process as well. So there's two exciting things in our student services office that I wanted to share this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Persico, would you like to come up, please? Hi everyone. Um, just a couple of updates for you. We have a variety of district-wide committees that are taking place this year, uh, one of which is the District Vision Committee. That committee met today, this morning, um, to continue its work that it had begun a couple months ago in really working to develop a vision statement and then from there a mission statement revision of our current mission statement or a completely modified new mission statement. So a lot of work has been done around consuming um, examples of vision and mission statements from across the area, other local districts, from across the state and across um, the country really. We've really kind of consumed a, a lot of those. We've critiqued those. We've kind of identified points that we like from each of those and, and we have had some brainstorming sessions and so today's work really encapsulated trying to put that vision statement into writing, which I think that the committee would agree it was not a very easy task and, and therefore we're still continuing with that because it's hard to put in words exactly what it is that we're trying to capture. Although we've identified a variety of elements that are important to us as a district. Um, and for your information, the plan is moving forward that once we do craft a variety of vision statements as well as a modified and or new uh, mission statement, we're going to get that all out to the community. So whether that be students, staff, um, parents, we have a variety of stakeholders already on on the committee. We have our superintendent, we have district office staff, building administrators, teachers, parents, students, two very excellent students that have really helped make the conversations really rich. Um, it really, they're amazing individuals, um, one from each of the high schools. So we're continuing our work. We're meeting again after the new year to pick up where we left off um, in really important work. And we're looking really to have something that people can identify with 
can recite and know what it is very clearly and quickly, um, something that people can own and that is really reflected of the community. So we'll be pushing that out to get feedback from all of our stakeholder groups. The second um, thing that we have going on curricularly is a curriculum review cycle. We've been working for the past couple of months, um, myself with directors, to identify when was the last time we purchased resources, when is the last time we've actually looked at new curriculum, revising curriculum. Um, and so from there, we were, develop, we were able to develop sort of a, a planned schedule, if you will, uh, in a five-year process, a cyclical process, that we have people at different areas, various stages of that cycle. Um, and so we've worked to get feedback from directors. We've pushed that out now to our teacher leaders, so our department chairs at the middle and high school level um, specifically for their feedback to make sure it looks right. So we've adjusted it a couple of times already and we look to finalize it soon so that we can have a process, a systematic process in place so that we are constantly looking at the curriculum. Does it meet our needs? Are our students um, performing at levels that we hope that they would be? Uh, are we implementing our curriculum as designed and with fidelity? Are there new standards that we have to modify curriculum for? And as a result, are there new resources that we need? Is there professional learning that's associated with that? And do our assessments align as well? So it's really going to be beneficial for us as a, a district curricular team to have something in place and so that we're not all looking at replacing everything all on the same year, but that that is spread out um, very me methodologically. Method, I can't even say the word, methodically. <laughs> ah, I need more chocolate today. So um, stay tuned. Once that is finalized, we will share it with you, but I do believe you all have it, um, it the second draft version um, after we've had input from directors, and now it's out there for teacher feedback, and then we'll have that for everybody. So those are just two quick updates. Right. Any questions? How do you measure the level of implementation across the, the district? So you mentioned finding out if curriculum is being implemented with fidelity, mm -hmm. how do you measure that? So if, as part of this process, there would be a needs assessment. And so really the desire here is to have that vertical alignment so that it, it might be just a, a year of middle school science replacing things and looking at curriculum. We have a committee in place that has elementary, middle, and high so that that vertical alignment is in place. So you're looking at things like assessments. You're looking at curriculum writing projects that need to happen. Do we have new standards? Where are those being implemented? Is there a new assessment that's part of those standards? And so on and so forth. So. Really, the desire is to have that vertical alignment as well as horizontal discussions, too. So a needs assessment, going back to that, what does that point to? Are there things that are being um, coming down from the state? All of those play into so how we look at that. the goal to have you know, implementation of the same strategies and curriculum at each of the different schools? Yes. Yes, we want consistency um, in a curricular area, content area, or in a grade level. So yes, we really want to make sure that there are like experiences no matter where a student goes to school, uh, whether that's on the east side of town or the west side of town. Uh, we really want to make sure that everything is aligned as, and consistent as possible. We know each building has their own personality and flair, but when it comes to implementing the curriculum resources, materials for students and staff are all consistent. So there's an expectation that that's happening? Correct. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to our student representatives report. I am going to, Megan, do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Megan from the West Senior is our student rep this evening. So. Thank you guys for having me. Um, to begin, our fall sports have been ending, and so boys volleyball this season went 3-15. and 15. Our girls volleyball went 9-10. and 10. They did pretty well this season. Um, girls swim was actually combined this year. We pushed for that. Um, having com having being like combined with each other, we were able to gain three wins this season, and we were um, in the bigger dish uh, bigger division because of West being in the bigger division originally. Um, we had multiple people make it to sectionals and um, championships meet this year that like they had not made before. Um, our boys. Uh, soccer teams were combined, and they succeeded very well this season. Uh, West football went six and three, and cross country did very well with runners making it to sectionals and states as well. Um, winter sports are starting up as well, and the musical, the cast list, actually comes out tonight for Mean Girls. So that's exciting. Um, the National Honor Society is doing, uh, did their canned food drive and the induction previous, uh, recently. 
And we have six foreign exchange students at West this year, all from different parts of the world. And that's really cool seeing like their different culture. And so this year we are bringing back Lingo Palooza, which is a little activity that we have for kids involved in uh, languages. And we have it down in the library. And there's different activities. We bring in different people to do um, like different crafts, different activities with the kids to get them engaged. And we'll have um, each of the foreign exchange students create a presentation to give to the classes as well. Um, also, I would like to mention, there was two rooms on the upper level of our school, rooms 210 and 212, that are a math and a fr uh, French teacher's room. And they had flooding due to the snowstorm. Each teacher came in with half, at least half an inch of water in their rooms. And I wanted to thank our custodial staff for being very adamant about getting the teachers out of those rooms, finding new places for them to go and teach their classes so that we, as students, were not exposed to mold and get sick. So that is all I have for this evening. Great. Any right. questions? No, oh, but thank you. It's a mouthful. Yes. All right, Al yeah. Allison from East Senior. Let's hear your update, honey. Okay, hi, thank you for having me. Um, just a couple updates. So ROCAP, a social studies national honor society, had their induction. We inducted 15 people after school. Um, we had Paul's Donuts and things like that to help with their induction to show them that. They were being presented something. Um, <laughs> Key Club had a canned Thanksgiving food drive. Um, Miss Dean Natale won that, and I'm pretty sure we raised over 1,500 um, cans. Wow. Um, the National Technical Honor Society had their induction. Um, the play Crush was performed, and even with the snow, it was still a hit, so that was excellent. Um, Project Lit was introduced to the whole district, both east and west. Miss um, Thompson is running that, and it seems like it's going to be a good program. Our French exchange students came in for a week, and we welcomed them with the French exchange dance. Um, I know they had a lot of fun at that. They really enjoyed that. Um, student Council is currently running a cannon bottle drive. Our hope is to get out um, $500 scholarships to multiple students, if we can raise that much. And then the Red Cross bud drive that was canceled due to snow is now happening in January. Nice. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, girls. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming and giving us your updates. Um, all right, we're going to turn it over to public comment now. So um, are we allowing public? We're going to have the public come up here. Okay. Yeah, we can come up here. All right, so um, at this time, we can move to public comment. If anybody would like to come speak to the board, this is, this is your opportunity. Um, this section is set, is set aside for the community to speak directly to the Board of Education. Each speaker is given three minutes with a total allotted time to last no more than 30 minutes. When called, please step up to the podium and state your name and address. Please be respectful in your comments and do not divulge any personal or confidential information. The information shared will be carefully considered and the appropriate person will contact you. If you would like to be contacted, please leave your information with the district clerk. So is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the board? Okay, <laughs> nice. Well, <laughs> so we have a full house, but that's good. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to reiterate, kids, I'm not allowed to sign your pig sheets either. You've got to go to a board member for that, okay? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're going to move to three, section three, and start with our presentation. We have an athletic update from Marissa. You stole all her thunder. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not good at this. So. Okay, so perfect. Um, so I was asked to present on the combining of schools, and it actually worked out perfectly because Megan had mentioned um, some of our fall teams that had already combined. So it's a perfect um, segue into it. I did want to start with some of the rules and regulations for combining of schools because I don't think everybody knows that. Um, so combining of schools is actually a NISFA, it's a state policy that we are required to follow. And this started a couple of years ago, I would say going back roughly about 10 years within the state in the section. And it was put forward for three reasons. One was the emergence of a new sport. 
um, if a school was interested in forming a new sport, but they just didn't have the level of interest, you were allowed to tag up with somebody. Um, the other one was declining um, number of participants in the sport, which was really one of the reasons that it was started because in some of the smaller schools across the state they were seeing a lot of that and financial reasons. So there's three reasons why you are supposed to um, combine. Can I just real quick, so when we say combining of schools, we're talking about sports teams across the schools, not physically combining schools. It's just athletic teams for anybody that may not know that. Just yep, to, sorry, I'm just no, athletics. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only <laughs> athletics up there. Um, so when you decide that you want to co uh, combine the athletic teams, there's a number of steps that we have to go through. Number one, first and foremost, you do need the Board of Education's approval. Uh, number two, then you actually have to ask permission and you need it from, if it's a league sport, like soccer is a league sport, swimming is a league sport, you need not only your league to vote yes, but you also need the section to vote yes. Then there's an application process where we ask for a whole bunch of signatures from the AD, from the superintendents of all combining schools. And then there is um, a classifications. Megan had mentioned that um, for boys soccer, um, they actually combined and then went up, or actually it was uh, swimming as well. Swimming combined and they moved up a classification. And that is because when you, um, when you end up combining, you have to take what we use as our beds numbers from each school, combine them, and then it usually it might bump you up a classification. Um, and then you do need the athletic council approval. And schools are actually only combined for a period of a year, and then you have to go through that process again. Typically, there is, in my small little timeline on the bottom, the section does ask that we follow the guidelines for um, the timeline and the guidelines for merging. For fall sport, they want me to have all the paperwork in by March. Um, for a winter sport, it's at the May prior meeting. And for the spring sport, they already had to be in in September. Um, but they do allow for emergency status mergers, which we have occasionally had happen this year. Um, at the end of each season, we just actually submitted them about two weeks ago. We have to do a combining of schools report. And what it does is it takes the roster from each sport. We have to designate um, how many kids were from East, how many kids were from rest, whatever it is. Send that in along with all the... Um, the highlights, the scores, everything. Because what ends up happening is the section six has a combining of schools committee. And that committee usually meets in uh, about two months after every sport. The uh, fall one is coming up in I think a week and a half. And they sit there and they review it. And they look to see, okay, when was Seneca combined, let's see, did they dominate? Um, is it an unfair advantage? Um, their, roster size pre uh, their roster size seems pretty high. Do we have to separate? Is this an unfair advantage to other uh, schools? The Section 6 uh, Combining of Schools Committee and the Athletic Council can actually deny any merger, and then they could ask you to reapply and bump you up a classification. That doesn't typically happen for us because West Seneca West, we are... Um, one of the biggest so we are already for most sports we're in that top tier but other schools if you take um, a lakeshore with a pioneer they might not be able to stay in a B classification they may approve them at a higher level at the A um, again the purpose of combining has to be one of the three reasons that I mentioned before if you look at what Seneca's um, most of our reasons have been declining participation. Our goal in merging is that we maintain the ability to offer the sport to our students while working on increasing participation in hopes that we could eventually separate again so we can have two teams on uh, both sides of town. That was looking a lot nicer on my original spreadsheet and now it doesn't look as nice, just so you know. Um, so I'm just gonna flip to my screen. Um, so the current combinations that West Seneca does have... It looks nice on the printer. 
Thank you. It really did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so boys uh, JV and varsity soccer, that was a new combination for this year. That just happened in 2022. Girls modified JV and varsity field hockey has been merged since 2019. Girls flight football, which was an emerging sport for last year, so um, we were to, uh, 22 was our first year. We're looking to combine again for this year. Um, golf has been merged since 2015. Girls Swimming, that was um, a late merger. That was one of those emergency status ones. And as Megan said, I found it to be very successful. Boys Varsity Tennis has been merged since 2015. Modified Cross Country, 2019. And Unified Bowling and Basketball since 2018. Those are all combinations of East and West teams. There are two sports currently where we have multiple school combinations. Um, our girls ice hockey team is West Seneca West, West Seneca East, Hamburg and Eden since 2015 and 17. This year we added Holland. That was at the request of Holland. They had three athletes that are hockey players and they were looking for a home. Um, so we volunteered to be that home. Um, and then wrestling, it kind of happened as well. Uh, Modified and varsity wrestling have emerged since um, 2018. Depew last year was looking for a home, and so uh, we have merged with them. This is the second year that we're with them. Their hope is eventually get some success in the um, combinations, or excuse me, in the program, get some more buy-in for wrestling, and then hopefully they can create their own team. So my recommendations for next year is boys soccer, take away the ones that have emerged from 2015 because those we're going to stay with. We've already said typically the state likes you to make your decision within three years. Um, what are you doing? And for tennis, golf, I have already said it is in our best interest to stay combined. Um, but some of our newer ones, my recommendations for next year is boys soccer. I found it to be very successful this year. Um, I would like to stay merged for the JV and varsity teams. Um, but keep our modified separate. We did pretty well with our modified separate. We had healthy numbers. Um, I want to say East may have had 16, and I think West was around 14 kids on each team. They had a great team, um, a great time. We're going to continue to monitor those. But then JV and varsity, it was a good experience, and we had healthy numbers. I want to say 20 and 22. So it was really good, um, and it, they ended up winning uh, six games this year, which was more than they've had in a long time. So I think that was a good one. Girls Swimming was a late emergency one, and Megan can say. Um, I think it was a great um, experience for all the girls. The East girls, um, they had to swim a little bit harder teams that they have swam before, but they actually, um, they at the end of the season, they said they enjoyed it. They liked being pushed that extra level, and I think we saw a nice, um, a nice healthy balance. And again, they're one-year mergers, so we continue to watch them. Um, cheerleading would be a new one. We've had two, this is our second year of doing intramurals. We have such an interest in seventh and eighth grade um, cheerleading. We are doing the APP testing constantly. Um, and what our coaches have done is they've run intramurals for the seventh and eighth graders that don't make the JV and varsity team because we don't have a modified team. So I would like to recommend adding a combined modified cheer team for the fall and winter of next year. Um, and then cross country was an emergency merger. Uh, we do have two new coaches that were appointed late last year. So what I would like to do is hold off on the merger at this point. Allow the new coaches who are West Seneca East employees to recruit and do some off-season talking to kids and seeing what the interest is and seeing if they can drum up enough to have a West Seneca East team and relook at it in June. I know I have timelines on there, but this would be one of those that we would go in, tell the league, we're looking to bring this team back, we're going to keep pushing, 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 and then by June make that decision. Um, so those are the four big recommendations for at least combining of schools for me for next year. I do, please don't anybody get upset by this, but there is some teams that I do keep an eye on or some teams that um, people from the community will call me about. These are two. You merged, you merged boys soccer. Why aren't you merging girls soccer? 
The numbers are too high right now at girls soccer, especially on the west side of town. We have a great interest um, on the west side of town. We're working on building that back up at the east side of town. We have a modified and a varsity team on the east side of town, um, and we also have a new coach that's in-house. So again, she's doing stuff at sale-ins and some off-season training. So just continuing to watch those numbers. And then boys ice hockey. I do get asked about boys ice hockey often because at the club level, they're combined. Right now, again, the West numbers are really good for boys ice hockey. The East numbers, they're, they're safe enough to hold our own team. Um, the fear in merging those programs is then we end up cutting a lot of kids that are interested in the sport. So those are two sports that I'll continue to monitor. Um, but whenever we make this decision, I really have to make sure it's of benefit to both sides of town and the least amount of kids that are um, without a team, if that makes sense. Questions? <laughs> so that's combining of schools for athletics. Please. The, flag, the girls fight football? Yes. My understanding of that is because it's a smaller program, we didn't do multiple teams because we'd be so, taking away from Yes. Them. So originally with girls fight football, they were only offering it to 11 teams in Section 6. So I did not want to hog it. And we also at that point were not allowing dual sport athletes, so I was not sure what the numbers were going to be. This year, we are, um, the section and the state are going full-fledged. I think in a y two years, you'll see a state championship for flag football. We are still working on the combined. The fear right now is when you add in any sport, it usually draws kids away from another sport. So at this point, the recommendation is to stay combined. We will allow for dual sport athletes, but we don't want to pull numbers away from other sports that have already been in existence. So again, we're going to continue to monitor that one. Is this uh, countywide uh, where maybe there isn't enough interest in a lot of teams? There, it's actually countrywide. Uh, the participation numbers have not rebounded as well since COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're really finding is, no offense to some of the kids out there, um, but we're finding that some of the 10th and 11th graders just that played in 7th, 8th, they just didn't come back. Um, they, got a, they got a taste of working and they can work. They can, there's a lot of things they can do after school. So we've really tried to put the interest at um, just getting to the elementary schools. We're starting to run more. We've got more intramural programs going. We've got um, you know, uh, community groups that are coming in between NFVB that's coming in to the elementary schools and really trying to, again, reintroduce athletics to kids. All right, so it's really a sign of the times. Isn't yes. It? I mean, Casualty. Yes, we we are a lot luckier than other schools because I could say, being having East and West, it's a it's an easy merger that a lot of people don't think. If we were down the road, Chicktawaga, and they started the swim season and only had six kids, it would be really really hard for them to partner up with Maryvale or Depew because of transportation, coaching, um, just getting that approval. Where we do have we have our partner so it's a little bit easier for us but yes we do have our work cut out for us of reintroducing athletics to community my question Marissa was related to that so the <clears throat> the state and the section hold schools like Williamsville Kenmore and West Seneca to the same criteria even though you're within your district to you have the same criteria <laughs> for that that Depew would to join up with JFK yes and that's a hard thing for people to understand. And they've actually brought it up at the state level of would it make it easier, would it make it harder. Um, and I, you know, and Dr. Zayas, the executive director for New York State, he asked me, he's like, you're in a district like that. And I'm like, we'll, we'll follow whatever rules. I said, but it is very hard when parents call me and say, well, I want to be on the East softball team, but I want to be on this basketball team and, and go back and forth, and they don't understand why, because it is, um, we all pay the same taxes, and it's, you know, they want to pick, and at right now, the state is not for it. They were trying to hold everybody to the transfer rules. Could it change? I could see some tweaking in it, but Williamsville's Kenmore, um, and West Seneca's, we are halted. Buffalo is as well. We have to follow the guidelines that are there. We have High school wise, we have less than 2,000 kids. Lancaster had, that's combined. Lancaster has more than that right. on their own. Right. So they have 
the same pull the draw from for one team where we have. Right. And that's kind of, that's one of the downfalls of this area in particularly is, um, especially our league is based, they base our schedule on size of school. And we happen to be the smallest school in Division One, And they don't, right now, look at competitiveness. And my coaches that are in the audience can know I will preach this every meeting that I'm at to change the schedule. Because I also believe that you'll see less combinations if we play more competitive games. If you, you took more kids play. More kids will play. Kids if you gave me them. if you gave me twenty basketball games that were within ten points each and it was competitive, I guarantee you I'm gonna have more kids play next year. If you gave me twenty basketball games where we might have gotten our butt kicked for forty points every game, you're not gonna want to play next year. So it's one of those continuous battles, which is why I do like that combining of schools is only a one year commitment because we can keep preaching what we want, but following their rules right now, okay. if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, you're good. Thank you. 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 All right. We're going to move on to our next presentation. Mr. Thiel. And we were in an even lower division. Than this, and we, uh, we get cross here. Yeah. 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 Yeah
instructional side, the largest single investment has been in reductions of elementary class size. Um, you'll see a presentation, I think it's scheduled for January, where uh, Dr. Savoni will you know, show you class sizes that um, are in most cases in the 20 student area. This district historically had had numbers larger than that. We've invested to try to give our teachers a greater foothold in reaching students directly. Um, but I think what's most important here is that the bulk of our investment has been direct professional education directly to students. Um, no, we didn't buy a lot of equipment. We didn't, you know, repair a building. We use this money to try to benefit our students. I know our tech integrators have done great work working with our teachers to, to infuse the Chromebooks into the curriculum. The uh, computer support assistance in every building has made a great deal of progress in terms of password issues, Chromebook malfunctions, you know, just getting the delays in response out of the system so that um, you're not relegated back to the yellow pad and pencil. Um, so that's a total financial impact with benefits added in of about $4.6 million out of a total $5.2 million expense expected. That's how it breaks out amongst all the grants. It's a lot of alphabet soup. There are 11 separate applications for these grants that were approved by the state. Um, it's a great deal of work to try to put all this together and will be audited on the same process uh, next summer, so that should be fun. Um, <laughs> additional spending includes the elementary summer school, which uh, this past year was about 265000 and our school resource officers, which we pay about half of out of our general fund and about half out of our federal funds. So, for 2024 planning, we have remaining monies under the Amer American Rescue Plan of about $4.8 million, depending on how the year comes out. We'll spend those out first before we look to the general fund for any support. But I think it's key to look at the third bullet, which is we have to have a heightened uh, priority and establishment of our budget goals. Like, what are we about? What do we stand for? What do we believe in educationally? Where are we going to put our, our, our funds for 2024? And again, this will, if we can improve the process this year as part of our 2024 budget, it'll make difficult decisions for the 2025 budget uh, a little more productive. And we'll have a matrix by which to measure you know, what, we, what we have, what we prioritize, and how we go about spending our money. Which brings me full circle. Um, December 2021, we approved those items as our budget goals. Um, I believe the budget meets those goals and we continue to exercise and uh, effect that plan. Um, I have not put forth budget goals for the current year. If I were to rewrite those today for your approval, they would, they would echo what we've just said. We've invested heavily in students in these areas. But I'm, I'm really reaching out to you today um, for any other suggestions beyond this um, to be discussed with our Finance and Budget Committee of the Board later this month and then presented to you in January for a budget goal and guideline document. So um, I open this for discussion or questions from the Board, ideas, thoughts, um, if not readily available after some reflection. If you could get back to me within a week, we meet late next week, I believe, as a Finance and Budget Committee and we can, we can put those together and circulate back out to the whole board in advance of a January meeting in approving the budget goal. So I would, our suggestion internally is to continue the class sizes at as low as possible, to continue the extended uh, AIS and literacy focuses, the middle school success labs we believe are, are meeting with a lot of people, a lot of kids and meeting their needs. Um, to continue the investment in the technology staff and of course the uh, social and emotional learning which is a key component of what's happening in our world, in our district, in our community right now and within our buildings. The superintendent spends quite a bit of hours a day dealing with those types of issues 
and you know we need to be on top of them operationally um, our facilities department is is challenged and accessing equipment purchasing equipment as you can imagine I think we ordered a truck yesterday the arrival time is unspecified the last time we ordered a truck they told us that they had ceased production of that model nine months after we ordered it and to reorder from a new one um, on the transportation side we we um, approved by the voters to buy uh, six buses I believe from six buses the prices on those buses have changed dramatically. We won't be able to buy six buses with the uh, funding allocated. It'll be more like four buses. So those are the types of things, the challenges that we face trying to deliver on what we promise the community and the, the district and the students. And I'm open to any and all input on what should be emphasized, de-emphasized, added to. It's your chance or email because there'll be a document next month that we're all trying to approve. Are we on schedule with our bond proposal? Are we on schedule with, the, with Young and Wright, the architects? and, and you Our know, current capital project? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, current capital project phase two um, continues. That's the middle school phase. Yeah. There'll be mm -hmm. a lot of work uh, at, West Seneca, at East Middle next year. Mm -hmm. um, phase three, which is the high schools, bids in January. Okay, so we're right on schedule. With the so the board will probably see those contracts for approval um, February area. Good. Um, again, well, the architect we're also going to be competing with a stadium now, yeah. which will have a dramatic impact on the labor pool and materials and available to districts and other people trying to do construction in western New York. Will the architects be uh, uh, presenting to us? You know, the I believe they've been scheduled for a board presentation. Yeah. I'm not sure if the okay. date's been set yet, but okay. probably around the time the bids were awarded for phase three would be a good time to sort of do a general yeah. recap. Mm -hmm. They have been meeting with the facilities committee and updating uh, the needs of the district with that group as well. January. In January. They're oh, supposed good. to present. January 3rd. Good. This money here, though, wouldn't be able to be applied to any of that. Am I, am I That's correct. correct. Okay. So <clears throat> I wasn't on the board at the time that this was all made. I want to applaud the board for and administration for investing in people and putting more professionals in with students to aid their, their learning. Um, my question is then, when will we see, what type of data will we be collecting to see what the return on that investment <coughs> has been? I think there's been uh, some data presentations scheduled or they're proposed to be rolled out to the board. I don't have this data schedule in front of me, what the presentation is. No, I guess that's not just for you, Will, that's yeah. more for... Oh, no, yeah. That, and, and that will be the time that we can make a decision that we continue down this path with this investment in these areas, or do we tear and go to a different, go in a different direction? I, I couldn't agree more. I'm a data guy. Um, anecdotes and stories and examples go so far. Um, they go a heck of a lot farther when supported by you know real data, in terms of you know caseloads, uh, you know current issues, uh, all those items, and you know whether it's instructional data, attendance data, social emotional data, you know, we need to really dig in hard there so that we're in a position a year from today to make decisions. Couldn't so agree more. Will the, um, this matrix, the decision making matrix, the value slash decision making matrix, is that being done within the budget and finance committee? Well, right now we're asking for feedback. I think we have to merge that with data sources so that when we come to you a year from now and say like okay we we think our first three priorities have to be x y and z we can show you a case not tell you a story yeah yeah so and looking at a variety of different data points too like for instance your map data so looking at students ela and math performance scores um, you know, the past few years, if you look at Regents exams and 3-8 assessments and things like that, there hasn't been the same emphasis on them just because of the pandemic. So 
Uh, that doesn't mean we're not tracking progress of students to see where they're going to be yeah, at. We need but, things that are pre-pandemic yeah. that we can compare to post-pandemic. Yeah. We need to be able to compare apple to apple. Sure. And see how kids are doing now as opposed to pre-pandemic. We... And we wouldn't want to diminish the individual classroom teachers' work that they're doing as well. That's why I think you come into some of the, you know, your, mid your formative assessments. You know, and I mean, to some degree, again, you can't just hang everything on anecdotal, but you need to be able to hear from our classroom teachers, our interventionists as to what they're seeing. So, you know, with their social workers, what are you seeing in terms of social emotional concerns? What are your biggest issues that you're dealing with on a regular basis? Um, how often are you, you know, you're getting these referrals? Um, you know, even just reading levels and things like that, too, going back to the academic side of the house, too. And those are things that we're monitoring right now. Um, you know, and honestly, just even, I, I think, too, I just I'll go back to the board's invested in infrastructure in terms of creating some leadership structures throughout the district among the teachers and administrators to be able to have some of the committee conversations that Carmen had referenced earlier to be able to just make sure that we're keeping an eye on that. And as you mentioned before, the importance of having a consistent approach, you know, across, you know, the district, you know, so fourth grade social studies looks the same, you know, in all five elementary buildings. Um, you're never going to have perfection, but I think, you know, it's important to continue to have the conversation so that we can strive toward, toward having that. So. Um, you know, we brought in some good professional development over the past couple of years as well, too, to try to help sort of align folks uh, in their work, you know, within their classrooms as well, too. So. Yeah. I would just like to reiterate what I agree with Vince. You know, I would like to see the data to support this. You know, what is the data on success labs that makes it, you know, one of our top three? I understand the class size reductions. I mean, that's, everybody is in, pretty much in consensus about that, but... I just feel like I need to see more detailed data to know what is the best route to go and where do we, you know, make those hard decisions. So I think that's going to be a very important conversation for all, all of us board members to have. But I do need to see, like, how do I know what's the most important thing? So that's uh, kind of what I'm, yeah, what yeah. I'm hoping to find. And I think as a board member, it's just, I mean, we, you know, we, we have to justify everything that we do to the community. So we have to be able to justify decisions based on, on data. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to have a conversation um, also sooner than later about how, you know, like the data because where we're at before the pandemic to where we're at after, I mean, I don't know that we're going to get back to where we were before the pandemic. Why, like, lowering class sizes was something we were doing before the pandemic. So personally, lowering class sizes, I would think as the class sizes moved up in the higher grades and we started seeing lesser and lesser intervention or you know, stuff that requires extra help, you could see it's working. That's over a timeline. This is so quick. I'd like to make sure we're establishing what we're expecting to see a year from now to kind of get an idea because the data is not going to be, you know, here's where it was before pandemic, we got back to it or we got better. Things could be so bad, we may have only, we may only get back halfway, I don't know. So I don't know where we were at during the pandemic. So I think I definitely want to be involved in learning what, what data, like how the data is working now, so that when we do look at it a year from now, I can see kind of what I'm expecting. Because it's, I don't think, I don't think we're going to have a, well, all of a sudden every kid's doing perfectly in school because of this. I, but is there going to be an improvement or are we looking at, well, what are we expecting to see the data to say to continue this program? Ed, you're correct. I mean, we did start working on trying to lower class size, particularly at the primary grades, even before the pandemic started. We've been gradually trying to add in, uh, for instance, like reading specialists uh, because of the feedback we were seeing, data that we were seeing you know, uh, in kids' reading levels. They were saying they needed more individualized support. You know, a lot of our reading specialists were doing like push-in work as opposed to pulling kids out in small group work. Research will tell you that, you know, honestly, if you've got a child that needs tier three instruction, they probably need to be in a group of two to three kids, maybe in some cases a group of one. Uh, to really get the level of reading support that they need. So I uh, just to your point, uh, that's absolutely what we were looking at. So and some of that's very granular, you know, even looking at like the DRA scores and you know, the map's not everything. You have to look at a variety of different data points to triangulate your data to get a sense for, you know, are we having the impact that we wanted to have? But you're absolutely right. We already were starting kind of to move in that direction as the pandemic was just starting to hit. So yeah, yeah that's, I guess I, I'm, I'm looking for the full picture of all the data not just the data next year, or the, by the one we see it next year of next last, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess, is, am I clear on like what I'm asking for? Like I wanna, 
I kind of want to see a lot of it as opposed to just the end just results a chunk of it, and right. say, hey, this was bad or this was good. It's like adding the reading specialist. At some point, you're going to know whether it's working or not. How are you going to know? Are there more kids being, you know, are there less kids being taken out individually at, high, at higher levels? Is the reading improved at higher levels? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I would expect to see. I'd like to see the numbers throughout. But some of the stuff I don't know that we're going to see. I don't know what, what improvements we're going to be expecting to see, so I don't really know what questions to ask at this point. So maybe that, that's what I'm asking about the data. I'd kind of like to see some of the data sooner, not of the final results, but right now to then kind of help see what I'm getting. I think what you're describing is some progress monitoring. Yes. Yeah, yeah, with yeah, you, yeah. you know, looking at. Way. Sorry, thank you for. Making Using it a simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> dumbing it down for Ed. No, no, not at all. Steps. Yes, this vernacular, you had it absolutely right. Yes, you had it absolutely right. Wait, I understand. I think we've set some very good goals, which we always have had for students in this district. And I just, you know, sometimes too many cooks spoil the <laughs> spoil the process. I, I, I think we have to be careful that we don't get so caught up in the process that uh, our goals are um, not reached. Understood. Yeah, I mean, you know, I like the word data or data, data however you want to pronounce it. Data. From Buffalo, it's data. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Data. But uh, we, could data. Get, we could get caught up in the process to the point where we don't really reach our goals. Right. Just yeah. a word of caution. Understandable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good point, Jan. All right. Thank you, Mr. Field. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, sir. All right. One more presentation. Um, Mrs. Persico and Mr. DePasquale, would you like to come up? Oh, is it just, okay, is it just, no, it's All right, well, she's going to come up to it. It's okay. She's going to move him along. Can I borrow Oh, sure. I realize he probably needs no introduction, but this is Franco DePasqua. He is our director of math and science and title grants. Um, a lot of work has been done over the review of algebra across the district, and Franco has developed a presentation for you that he's going to take you through, um, and I'll make sure he sticks to his timeline. So I'll <laughs> stay out here. Many people have tried that before. Oh, don't you <laughs> You know, it's interesting. Good evening, everyone. Happy holidays. I was sitting in the back there next to Dr. Savoni, and I looked down, and I saw my ID. And I was like, man, who is that guy? And I can say this. I'm looking at Mrs. Dalbo here. In my 18 years, I've done a lot of presentations on algebra. And I look at specifically you, because this will be like the 900th one that you've heard. <laughs> Because Mrs. Dalbo has been here from day one over the years since I began here 18 years ago. And algebra, I think I've said algebra, the actual word algebra more in my 27-year career in mathematics education than any other mathematics word. So tonight the topic is algebra. algebra. Excellent. Excellent. You can hear me okay in the back, I'm assuming? Okay. And... Uh, the years haven't been so kind on my eyes, so I had to also borrow these from a colleague in the back here as I read my own notes. <coughs> All right, timeline of events. You, there was a handout in the back. I do not expect that you're able to read that up there, and obviously you're more than capable of reading, but I'd like to take some time to read some of these points in terms of the timeline of events. There was, from my lens on this, this began when we started a conversation here on increasing the advanced regents diploma rates and specifically students going to higher mathematics courses. And there were several questions at the time, which are not included here, but they were provided in a backup document to the Board of Education in regards to things that they wanted me to examine and to look at which I believe at the time I answered through a presentation I did in this room. Actually, uh, Craig Ersing was actually here with me. As the year rolled on in 21-22, 
We took a closer review of the math and science course offerings throughout the district. And through that review, there was a two-year Algebra one course today or tonight that you'll hear me refer to as stretch, stretch algebra. And that's simply the same course. It's done over a two-year window instead of a one-year window. And it was highlighted due to its increased enrollment, that growing enrollment that it had seen over the years. A presentation was then seen at Erie Wimbosis where it was done regionally about students in stretch algebra. Now moving on to Algebra 2 because they were pigeonholed. They were pigeonholed into taking Algebra 1 over a two-year window and they never arrived to the point where they could get an advanced Regents Diploma. And that is done under the pretense that those kids would be the kids who would take that course, which I'm going to get into in a little bit. There were continued discussions and review of the two-year course with middle school teachers, principals, myself, Ms. Persico, as well as an education consultant that we're using through our um, TSI in terms of our umbrella, in terms of being in need of improvement. There was, at that point, after that meeting, there was a reduction placed in the number of students placed in algebra stretch for this school year. As the timeline continues, there were additional meetings held with the high school principals, again, Ms. Persico, as well as myself. And out of that came the development of the Stepping Up program, which was run last summer. And that was also with the help of the middle school principals with identifying students that we felt needed additional algebra support in eighth grade, pre-algebra support, I should say, actually, to lead them to algebra in their freshman year. So that was put in place this past summer. Then the conversation continued on in the fall about discussions focusing on the move away from stretch algebra and a plan was shared and hand, really was handed off. And I got to thank uh, our two department chairs as well as the math department being here tonight. And Beth and Linda have been, Beth Busink and Linda Banker have been instrumental in helping me vet some of the data that I'm going to share here tonight. So I wanted to uh, do a shout out to them. And that was shared with them, student services, but it was developed by the high school principals, Ms. Persico, and myself. Then what happened was, at a meeting at the high school, I think it was a day-to-day, -day if, I'm, if I'm correct on that one, don't quote me on that, but it was one of our uh, regular meetings. The plan was shared out. At that point, BOCES was asked to present on that previous slide that I had, on that presentation of the stretch, they were asked to come to the district on a staff development day. The exact date slips my mind, but it was recent on our last staff development day, and to present on the stretch piece. After that, there were concerns that were brought to the attention of the district. And I thank you for inviting me here tonight, and, uh, you know, Superintendent Bystrack for asking me to do a presentation on where are we at with this and what is the recommendation. So, the rationale for the transition. Let me take a little back step here. You may or may not know, I'm assuming you do, the first administration of the next generation Algebra 1 will be next school year in 23-24. This year we will be administering this spring in grades three through eight, we'll be administering the next generation math as well as ELA tests. And I do hope that we get as many students as possible to sit for that assessment. As we enter into this, this, uh, this I'm gonna call it a fresh start, out of COVID, next generation math, that we get these students to sit for this exam, which will be digital. They will not be taking it in what I now call the analog version, which is obviously on paper, even though they will have scratch paper, but that's a whole other presentation. I'm more than happy to come back to do that one. 
but through the rationale also, we didn't notice that too many students were taking algebra over two years for incorrect reasons. And I say incorrect because we found that many students were placed due to attendance, not coming to school. That to me is not a good reason why a student should be in a program over two years. It should be because of their mathematical abilities. We'll talk more about that. Single digit numbers of students continued on with Algebra 2 after Algebra Stretch. That was another concern. And the very charge, if you go back to the original slide of why I originally started down this whole road was raising the advanced regions diploma rate. And we found that the students working with student services, that the students who go on to earn the advanced regions diploma rate in this district are single digits. So, what are the facts telling us? I don't need the glasses, I made the font bigger on this one. Students are not allowed, it's important to know that this isn't an opinion, this is a fact. Students are not allowed to sit for a Regents exam until after they have completed 100% of the course. This is why our Algebra 2 program that we do run over, and we have um, our teachers here tonight that run that, they know we run that over three semesters and not over four because we have to make sure that in order to assess the kids in January, we've completed the course. Hence, those kids earn a credit and a half. They don't earn two credits for that. And we have another piece that they, and again, I point to the department, uh, oh, fill in quite you, nicely. I, I need a point of clarification. Kids take algebra over two years, That's and they only get one credit? No, no, no. They get two credits. Okay. They get two credits. It's, it's if they do it over one year, because it's based on seat time, it's, if they do it over one year and they complete the entire course, yes. one credit. If they take that and stretch that same material out over two years, and they have two years of seat time, they get two credits. Correct. Okay. okay. Why is this relevant, what I just told you? The one-year program allows them to take the exam in June. So just follow me on this. They start it in the fall. They go through the school year. June comes. They finish the course, period. Teacher says they finish the course. Ms. Double's my student. She's, she's, you might give you my student. Thank you. She takes the course. She finishes after a year. She takes it in June. Unfortunately, she fails it. I'm sorry. True. <laughs> she fails it. She can then go on and take grad point, which is a summer program that we offer to our students in the district. She's then eligible to take it again in August. You failed it. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> fails it again. She fails it again. She's then eligible to go in into an AIS room, AIS program, I should say, not necessarily a room, and she's allowed to take it again in January. And now she passes, she's done. She doesn't get a credit and a half. She still gets just a credit. Everything's based on a credit. It's the duration in which you learn the material. Mm -hmm. She learned the material in 180 minutes a week over 40 weeks. That's the definition of a credit in New York State. So that's, she gets a credit for doing that. Now, Commissioner's Rights, part 100.5.3.4. You know what's crazy? I didn't even have to look this up because I keep this on my laptop because I reference this so much, this reg. And this reg specifically says, mathematics, three units, three units of credit of mathematics, which shall be at a more advanced level than grade A. I'm going to pause right there. I can't tell you how many places do not follow that. But I'm just going to leave that at that. We do. We follow that. Which shall be at a more advanced level than grade eight shall meet commencement level learning standards as determined by the commissioner provided that no more than two credits shall be earned for any integrated algebra, geometry, or algebra two and trig commencement level math courses. You cannot run pre-algebra in the high school. If you do, you cannot give credit. There are districts around us that do do that. They are in clear violation of this commissioner regulation. You cannot offer a pre-algebra course. You can't say kids come in in ninth grade, we're going to put them in pre-algebra. You can. You can't give credit, though. Many colleges do that. Erie Community is a great example. They offer a beautiful program where kids come in, they sit for a year, and how many credits do you get? Zero. You get zero. It's a non-credit-bearing course because it's considered a high school course. Okay, it's the same thing here. 
Mr. Shanahan, where am I pointing, by the way, to get this thing to advance? Over here? Uh, yeah, right here. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the board of ed, today I gave a file to um, Ms. Lotza. Thank you. She has the backup documentation that goes with these, this very brief slide. And as one of my mathematics colleagues here has pointed out to me, I would have gotten a point deduction or two on the Regents exam because I didn't put title on my graph. So anyways, I readily accept that. So what is this? What is this chart? What is he trying to show here? So East Senior, West Senior. We have the percentage of kids, and I took out the Regents exam. The Regents exam is not included in this. This is passing the course. Because the Regents exam to me on this it was offered, it wasn't offered, then they were sort of bringing it back during the COVID. You know, there were all those, there were all those mixes. So I don't have a consistent Regents result, so I can't compare it because the exam didn't exist. They didn't offer it, they didn't run it. So, does that make sense? No. So, with that said- No, not set, really. When they didn't offer it, when? Tw how, yeah, I need help on that one, I don't have those notes. 2020, 2020, 2021, Okay. 2021. Oh, thank you. So you take those out of there. Thank okay. you. Okay. Right. So with that said, East Senior, this is the passing rate of the course. And you can see, um, I, I'm not going to read those off to you because you can clearly see them on the screen. And then you see West Senior. Now to the right of those, you see at the end of the, the, end of the stretch program, the percentage of kids passing the course. Okay, because remember, kids need course credit. There's two bins. They need course credit, they need exam credit. This is the course credit bin, okay? If you look at those numbers, you can see, comparatively speaking, 80% versus 81, 68% versus 83, 97 versus 94, and you know, the numbers go on, you can take a look at that. There are two lenses that are used when looking at this. And again, I'm just gonna present the numbers as they are. The first line says this, if that's done over two years, and if we look at that first batch of numbers here, I'm just pointing to this one, it's comparable, but why didn't those kids do a lot better if they had a two year exposure? The counterpoint to that is, well, they did it over two years, so they did equally as good. So there's two lenses of looking at this, and I've gone, back and forth with many conversations with people about that. And again, they're both interesting conversations. But again, I present this data for what it is. These are real numbers. And again, I thank our department chairs for assisting me in uh, vetting these, these stats. Now, let's look at this. This is current, se this is current sections. Current sections show East Senior, West Senior. I took out the teacher's names, not relevant. Because this is not about comparing teachers at all. This is about looking at the sections, looking at the number of kids that we offer. So right now, at East Senior, approximately 25% of the cohort is enrolled in stretch. Cohort being defined as when kids come together during their freshman year, okay? So the current cohort, 25% of the kids are enrolled in stretch. At West Senior, it's approximately 15%. If I jump to the second half of this course, which would have, these are kids are majority, majority, sophomores, okay? You have 37% of those kids are enrolled in B, the second half, it's called 1A, 1B. And at West Senior, it's at 23%. And again, these are numbers. I'm presenting you with factual data off of sections we run. So now, what are the takeaways off of those? I have six takeaways. E Senior has approximately 10 percentage points more, not percentage, percentage points, more students in Algebra 1 than West Senior. E Senior has approximately 14 percentage points more students in Algebra 1B than West Senior. But, but, from fall of 21 to 22, E Senior reduced their Algebra 1A enrollment by 12 percentage points. West Senior reduced it by 8 percentage points. And if we look at this as a district, hence my favorite one West Seneca quarter zip that I love to wear to these presentations, because we are a district, even though we have two, high, two separate high schools. 20% of this cohort right now is in 1A. 
personally, my opinion on that, if that's what's being asked, it's a good number. 30% is not. So 30% of the students in cohort, of the cohort who would have been freshmen last year, who are now in 1B, approximately, okay, are in the 1B program. Now, here's my recommendation. That this district continues to look at the following quantitative data from the two middle schools. Math data, which we give three times a year to every student in this district in grades three through eight. Midterm grades, which is the exact same midterm, and these folks have been great because I'm looking at the math department in front of me here. They've been working on these midterms. We give a consistent midterm. We have for years. We give a consistent midterm across this entire district starting in grade six. So it's not like one teacher gives one and another teacher gives a different one. It's a consistent metric. And we report everything in eDoctrino and report card grades. And if the data points us in the direction for algebra stretch, my opinion on this is we will provide it. We will provide it to these kids for a limited number of students, which goes back to this slide. When you look at these numbers, okay, you can see it decreased from the year before. So again, for a limited number of students, not just ENL, not just transfer students, and not just self-contained. Again, though, I can't stress enough, we absolutely, and this goes along with the theme that I heard in the prior presentations, we need to use data. Anecdotes are nice. I got great stories over 27 years I could share with you. If you got all night, I can get started, but I don't think you want that. Okay? <laughs> but it's not just the anecdotes. It's about what does the data tell us. So now, what does this recommendation do? It increases the potential in raising, it increases the potential in raising the advanced regents diploma rate by having less students in stretch and more students in Algebra 1 going into Geometry and Algebra 2. And there's an asterisk, which I want to talk about in a minute there. And it still offers stretch to the students who need it due to mathematical reasons and not attendance reasons and other such reasons. This ultimately does what is in the best interest of the students involved. Why do I have that asterisk? The caution I have here is we need to look at the number of students who are exiting Algebra 1 and going into geometry, then into Algebra 2 to get that advanced regents diploma. I don't know if we're necessarily looking at the right group of how to drive up our advanced regents diploma by, by, by compressing algebra stretch too much. So that's something, and you see I put there, this is another conversation, I'm more than happy to come back for that one. But we need to really take and squeeze and take a good look at how many kids are exiting Algebra 1 to Geometry to Algebra 2. Because without that, they don't get the Advanced Regents Diploma. So that's a conversation, certainly for another, another time. I, knew I, I know I was given limited time to do this. I certainly would have went more in depth on that. But um, as Mr. Thiel said before, uh, I'm going I'm to take his lead on this. Certainly ask any questions. If I can't answer a question on the spot here, I will certainly uh, uh, let it sit, get the data together. Not let it sit like sit around. Let it ferment. Let it let really soak in so I can give you an educated response on, and a data-driven response on what it is you're looking for. But at this point, if you have any questions, I'm more than, I'm more than happy to uh, feel free. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I have a question from a student's perspective. Sure. So what is the advantage of, say I was in an Algebra 1 course, but I needed extra help. What is the advantage of going straight to geometry if I'm still struggling with that algebra concept and failing the exam? What is the advantage of going straight to geometry to get the advanced diploma if I'm still not understanding the course okay. before? Fair enough, fair question. So there's a couple things at play that I would, I would need a little more information than that from you, okay? One of the things I would be thinking about is, and I'm not expecting you to answer these right now, okay? What year are you? Are you a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? Are you a, uh, did you transfer in? Are you an ENL student? 
Are you a special education student who has an IEP that I need to look at? Those are some things I would need to know. I would need to know how many credits you have accrued because in order for you to graduate from West Seneca, West, I'm going to point glasses back on there. West Seneca West, you need three credits in math, okay? And you need to pass a regents exam. Not necessarily algebra. That said a lot. They got to pass algebra. They don't have to pass algebra. They have to pass a regents exam. Either algebra, geometry, or algebra 2. It just happens to be that algebra is the, the most common, if you will. So you want to leave here probably when you're 18, most likely, okay? You don't want to be sticking around any longer than that. So part of it is, it's a balancing act. I have to make sure that you can get, if I'm, West, if I'm representing West Senior, okay, I have to make sure you can get those three credits. And if I just keep waiting for you to pass the test and I don't get you into the next course, per se, that earns credit, you won't have enough credits by the time you're a senior. And guess what? I'm going to have bad news for you and your folks at that time. You're not graduating. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just confused because, like, if I were to take an Algebra 1 stretch course mm -hmm. and take it over freshman and sophomore year. Which would get you, and you passed? I, in this scenario? Yes. Then you get two credits. And then I wouldn't take anything the second half of sophomore year. Because uh, of the stretch course, are you saying it's two years? Two years. Okay. And then I would take geometry, and then I would still adv advance to Algebra 2 and right. say I graduated with that. You would get the advanced regents okay. diploma. Assuming. You passed all three regents, no, Got it. all three regents exams. Got it. And assuming you passed all three courses. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? Yes. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, can you just um, refresh my memory on when the board had a discussion on increasing advanced regents diploma rates and students in higher level mathematics? So courses? there was a, I don't remember the exact date, but when we taught, when I, I was asked to do a presentation in regards to, um, uh, i got to think of the date, specifically. Um, was it last year? It was, it was last year, Spis but I'm trying to remember what month, but it doesn't it matter. It's not. It's, it's Yes, correct. Okay. So with that came a set of questions mm -hmm. that I received from the district okay. in terms of here are all the questions that okay. we want answered in our presentation. I see. And within those questions was how are we going to chip away, and during that night there was a conversation here. Um, in regards to what does that look like? How are we getting more kids to get to achieve at those higher levels? Mm -hmm. How do we get more kids? We're talking, I remember, um, AP classes. We're talking about, you remember, mm -hmm. recall that? <laughs> so, so I'm not crazy having this conversation. We had this conversation. Yeah, and it's, I believe yeah. I just was wondering if it was last year. Yeah, it was last, it was last, year. It was, it was last year in terms of how do we get to this point of raising uh, Raising these standards, raising these expectations, more advanced regions diplomas, pushing, pushing kids on to take these classes. So, okay. Can, can I answer I, your question? Yes, it does. Can okay. I just make a comment, though? Because um, I don't think that was the whole conversation. Um, oh, no. I, I think it was a piece of it. It was a piece of it. And I think, um, again, you know, why do we need all students to graduate with advanced regions diplomas? It's just not... No, and I, it's just, not for every just, student. Just for, just just for clarity, people. though, just for clarity for this presentation, it was never said that all regents, all students need to. Okay, that was never it, stated. It just keeps getting brought up. So I just have to say, um, you know, we do value students in higher level courses, but we also value courses which address the needs of students who need additional time and resources to be successful. Um, I just, I'm, I'm a firm believer that not all students can or need to take higher level courses. Um, so it's just important to remember that one size doesn't fit all. And when I see... But if I may, if I may on this Just stuff, a second, okay? The, can the, I finish, please? Just sure, let me finish. Sure, um, sure. When I see some of the, you know, the requirements or um, the reasons that kids, you know, are recommended into certain courses and I see map data, ah, and I know you like map data, but... Um, I don't know. I think at the elementary level, I think that map data is we have to be very cognizant of what good data looks like. And, um, you know, I've seen my boys' map data, and it's scary. And they're both very bright math students. So I just, some of these, some of these things just aren't making a whole lot of sense to me, Franco. And, um, and quite honestly, I'm just a little bit bothered because I feel like this all seems like the board, this was like a board's decision. And I have to publicly state it was not. 
this, this move to move away from stretch, it was not the board's decision. And it was not discussed thoroughly, um, you know, before tonight. So I just have to say that. May I? Please. A couple of clarities. The, no one's pushing all advanced readers diplomas. That's not being pushed at all. That was not stated in the presentation. We certainly want to increase that rate. That's the first piece. The, the other piece with my recommendation is in line with what you just presented, which is giving kids those choices. That is the recommendation. Okay. So what I'm hearing from, what I'm actually hearing from you is an agreement to the recommendation that I'm here presenting tonight. So it's, it's 100% in line with doing it. Okay. Because we want to offer, and you heard me say up here tonight, looking at that 20% as that number. And um, the last piece is, and I don't believe that this right now in this forum is the appropriate forum to have that conversation because I don't want, I don't feel that it's, I don't feel that it is fair or appropriate that we have these types of conversations in a public forum when it is clear just five minutes ago, even less, that it was stated that a conversation was had in this room. So I don't want to play I agree, disagree with you. All I know is I know what my charge was and I know what I followed through on. So whether we agree or disagree with that, it is, was crystal clear to me what my charge was with, with the stretch program. So I, I, would, I would defer to Superintendent Bystrecht on, uh, on this piece. I'm gonna say in the big picture, just I'm being deferred to, so I would just say the big picture, I think we want to see, and it has been a constant ongoing discussion. We'd like to challenge students to the extent that we can. So I think uh, as far as what Franco is referring to in terms of the number of kids that we're going to refer to the stretch program, I've heard it said as well that we referred maybe too many kids. I think we need to maybe take a harder look at who we're referring to that program. I think it's important that we challenge kids. Uh, I would agree, Frank. We don't, not everybody needs to get an advanced designation diploma, but I think we should always be asking the question, how can we challenge kids more? So, and I think this it stems from that. Well, so, wouldn't the way of getting there would eliminate the need for it rather than taking the course away? But what, when are kids Id identified to be accelerated? In that is an excellent, excellent point. So what we've done now is we identify those kids in sixth grade. Okay, so we should, at sixth grade, we should be identifying kids that might fall into the area that need to go to, are going to eventually end up in stress. We start that you conversation. You have a middle school problem here. You don't have a high school Correct, problem. correct, 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 correct. So what we've done is, and I think, I think you and your support for this, you saw on the previous slide, we have labs now put in place that we're using our COVID money for. As well, well you don't have kids that are, automa are they automatically connected to that? To are they automatically connected? If a kid's identified, they go to math lab? They go to math They lab, go to they math AIS. Matter. They go to math AIS if they're identified. But it's not their teacher. No, correct. Okay. Now, uh, in some cases it is. I don't want to say in all cases. In How some cases are, they may see the same teacher. How else are they identified to go into AIS at the elementary? Um, if not well, I would love to... Elementary or middle school? <clears throat> Elementary, I'm Elementary. asking, yeah. So we look at, now, map data, it was pointed out, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make a comment back to, do I love map data? I love all data. <laughs> <laughs> Not just map data, I love all data. And one data set that we don't have enough of is state exam data. The three through eight opt-out rate is too high in this district. So what happens is we don't have enough of that data, so it forces us to use map data, it forces us to use report card data. So what happens is when we actually want to pull state exam data, we don't have it. No. I'll so, push back on that because yeah. you have built common assessments, Correct. right? And you can choose the standards. You choose the standards that you know need to be, be covered. You don't need state data. You can create your own data which, without that state. Which we do. We do, but I'd like that comparative what measure. Do you need that for? What do you need state? Because I want to compare it against the other 250,000 kids who sit for the test, which I don't have. Okay. All right, I have a final question. Are you offering stretch algebra next year? Yes. How many sections? Do you know yet? Well, I won't know the number of sections because it's, dri it's driven off of how many kids need it. The, okay. So the, we're going to look at, yeah, we'll look at, we'll get map data. Mm -hmm. We'll get report card data. We'll get, um, I'm missing a data point that I have written down there. Midterm data. And 
we will talk like we do every year to the eighth grade teachers. And with that said, we will, uh, my recommendation is to run it yeah. for a limited number. It got too, I'm going to use the word bloated. I like that word tonight. It got too bloated. So it is got, there going to be a cutoff for? Capped. Yeah, is it going to be capped? I would like to see that if we can realistically look at that 20% mark, which you've heard me now reference a couple times, mm -hmm. I think that is a reasonable number. To start getting into the majority of our kids, I shouldn't say majority, that's not accurate, but high 30s, I just feel that's too high. I think our students are capable of more. I just do. Because remember this, too. How many other courses or stretch programs throughout the district? I just want you to stop on that for a second. And I want you to really let that sink in. How many other courses are stretch? Is there, is there stretch? Well, global isn't really stretch. Global is a two credit. Global is designed. If it was stretch, it'd be over four years. Well, if you took AP, then you get one. You know, one yeah. The, yeah. But, so we do have. Hard course. So, oh. But I do want to say this, too. In addressing the, the challenge that I've been faced with, with raising advanced regents diploma rates and raising higher expectations, I would like to start exploring for next school year, and I just sent the email out to the buildings today. Okay, the department hasn't seen it yet, but I'd like to see kids go from our algebra in eighth grade to an honors geometry, to resurrect that and bring that back, to give those kids on the opposite end of math challenges, okay? Yeah, this doesn't affect our advanced placement uh, with universities and so forth. This is different. I mean, this is different. This other, is different. Yeah, because in our other subjects, yeah. they, you know, my girls, I know, you know, get a lot of credits already in the university. Sure. Left, yeah. And that would be an option. But I'd like to see us move down the pathway of that honors geometry and opening that up for an opportunity for kids when they get to the high school. At the end of the day, folks, this is what's going to happen. We're all going to do. Every person in this room, I'm looking at the young people here, we're going to do what's right by you at the end of the day. And I can tell you this, after being in this work for 27 years, I'm going to do what's right by you, of what makes sense. That's why I do this work. That is why I'm an educator. That is why I've been in math ed. It's about what's right for the young people in this District. I know, I know can I ask a question about middle school? In middle school, if can I ask? Work, can I ask? Not appropriate. All right. I'm sorry. We're going to have to move on. Yeah. So, can, can I just ask a question about the middle school? At the middle school level, if students do not pass a certain number of their exams, are they retained, say, like in seventh or eighth grade, or are they just moved along? We have a summer program. I could. Okay. Defer, that's a whole other. That's a whole other conversation. Okay. But there's a variety of factors that that kick in there. Okay. Right. Real quick questions. Okay. One, you had mentioned that there was more percentage in the second part of the stretch than the first part. Am I not understanding that correctly? There, there was a. Um, how can more people be in? Stretch. It's two years. They, they reduced the number of kids that they, entering in it as new students. Mm -hmm. So there's still some kids. There was a higher number of kids that started off the year before that moved into the B. So you still you don't want to just put that you had to do something. It allowed them to continue with the stretch program. They just reduced the number of kids going into the stretch this cut this year. Okay. Yeah. It, I, and again, maybe I was reading it wrong, but it looks like more kids are in Algebra 1 than Algebra 2. So are you looking at this? Are you looking at this? Yeah, line, look right? at that. This one? Yeah. Like, so my, my again, I'm not okay, so intelligent it's, as you people hear about this stuff. But you should have the same amount of kids and stretch both years. But what happens is these, these kids here are current. Right? These kids are current freshmen. Okay. 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 Whereas these kids are sophomores. Okay. Okay. I got it. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I just, again, I, I was confused on that part. Yeah. So, um, and then the only other question I had was you yes. said yeah, kids are, it's an attendance issue. So is that a whole separate thing that you're looking That's at? That's a whole other thing that we're looking at because what happens is we got to be really careful that just because, and I don't say just because, just in a cavalier way by any stretch, it is our social responsibility to make sure kids are in school. 
personal belief. If they're not here, they can't learn. So when they're not here, what happens is many of them get slated for putting them in the two-year program. That's not where they belong because we never ask the question about what's their math ability. We never ask that question, what's the math ability. We're basing it, in some cases, on whether or not they missed 80 days, 20 days, no days. And so if the child's mathematical ability says, you know what, they can do great in one year, but they're just not coming to school, then we put them in one year. Okay. Do we do or you're working on that? No, we do. Okay. We do. Not in all cases, though. Okay. And I have to tell you, the department's been great about saying that if a kid's in a stretch program and they don't belong there, we move them out. You put them, you know, you put them in the one year and vice versa. I just had a conversation with an individual yesterday at one of our high schools about, you know what, I just got, I think it was five, kids moved into the stretch program because they just aren't, they're, they're drowning right now. So, okay. there's a lot of moving, listen, there's a, I know there's a lot of passion around this. There's a lot of passion around this, okay? Thank you. A lot of passion. A lot of passion. But we want to make sure, and I do believe that everyone in this room has what's in best interest of, of young people. We could agree or disagree, had some opinions here or there, but I do believe that at the end of the day, we want to do what's right. Hence, the recommendation was presented. I know I went over my time here, but I want to make sure we give the... Uh, the students, the full benefit of our conversation. Thanks for presenting. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, we are going to move on to the consent agenda. Okay, and it begins uh, on number four, and it goes to section five, section six. I believe. Doesn't it go all the way goes up to eight? All the way up to eight. Yep. eight. Yeah. Five so. through eight. So I will give you all a moment to look through that. It is our personnel, our coaching appointments, our um, committee of special education reports, and we will end there and we will do a separate vote on new business. So I'll give you a minute. Do you need a minute, Jan? I um I'll start. I'll start with a motion. Yeah, I just need a I have a motion and a second and then no discussion and we vote. Is that okay? Yeah. Can I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to move on 4A through 8B consent. Okay. Can I have a second? Please? I'll second. Diane seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nope. Okay. Passes 6-0. All right. So we are on to 9, new business. All right. So we have a donation, um, our budget calendar, which I hope everyone had a chance to look at. Our fund balance is in there. Oops, sorry, that's uh, executive. <laughs> um, some resolutions for BOCES hardware and phones. So can I have a motion for 9A through 9D? I'll make a motion. All right, Molly. I'll second. Vince, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, pass the six zero. All right. Um, I like to do E separately. This is a contract for our assistant superintendent of education, exceptional education. May I have a motion for that? I'd like I'll make to. Oh. Okay, I'm going to go with Diane. <laughs> Diane makes a motion. May I have a second? I'll second. Molly seconds. Any discussion? No. Oh. I just like to say thank you to Mrs. Fowler, and you know mm -hmm. we're happy to have you on for another five years. Thank you for your service to our district, thank and you. thank you, Mrs. Fowler. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, pass the six zero. All right, let's do um, F, G, and H together, please. This is the West Indoor Track. Um, field trip, or it's, it's actually an invitational competition, sorry, and East Varsity cheerleading, and an MOA for with the clubs. We have a lot of interest in musicals, so oh. that's good news. Mm -hmm. I'll move. <laughs> yep. Okay, Jan's going to move on 9F through 9H. May I have a second? I'll second. Ed seconds. Any discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope, passes 6-0. All right, so we do not have to go over our informational documents. 
i'm actually we go over them but we don't have to approve them and we're going to move to board action at this time and we have a few topics on our agenda if you will move to one of the last pages actually you will see so i wanted to open the floor up for any board members who wanted to um talk about anything but we do have to talk about adding a june work session so um i believe we had asked for um, some presentations and our schedule was tight and we usually do a um um, I'm sorry, we honor the uh, retirees. retirees. Yeah, we honor the retirees, so we, and also possibly our top 10, but we're thinking to move those as well. So I was hoping people could look at their calendars and add a June work session. Awesome. Our GED, our GED kids too. Oh, yes, and our GED kids. Does it have to be um, a June work session, or could we do it in May? Um, I suppose that's open as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think whatever works for, you know, the majority of our board members. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have a board uh, board meeting, I believe, May 9th. May 2nd? No, May 2nd. Yeah. That's yeah. the budget hearing? Yeah, that's the budget hearing. And June's riddled with different activities mm -hmm. district-wide. I know. So that's why I was just I thinking May. I would comfortable seeing a calendar before. Yeah. Before making a decision? Yeah. Okay. Well, would you be able to just give me some days I could possibly look at? Sure. Just a few days. Um, can I have some days in June as well? Because I usually go away the last week of May. Do you? I do. For oh, Memorial Day. Okay. So, but we can always have a meeting without me. You'll just have to run it, Molly. Wink, wink. <laughs> I vote you. Molly, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're talking about this is when we would do the um, honorary three. Yeah. I wonder if we would, if we had it a little earlier, would we have maybe more attendance too? Mm hmm. I don't know. I, I don't, don't know. know. May is a little... Okay, so you go away the... What's that? For our handbook, it's supposed to be in June. So. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you, Nicole. So it has to be in June? Mm -hmm. Our last or work we can session? Make a motion to change our handbook. Yeah, we would have to make a motion I mean... to change our handbook. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Let's just make it in June. <laughs> okay. okay. So yeah. we have a June 6th regular board meeting and... Um, I mean, we can, like Mr. Bystrike said, we can have another one that week. We can have one the 13th, the following week, or the 12th. So if you would just offer me some days, I would really appreciate it. It's, I'm just looking at our, our like, calendar, and it's just, like, we don't have our dates in yet. Like, school, like, our, our actual oh, our board actual. of ed dates aren't, like, in, do, are you seeing them? Just the in your calendar? June 6th. That's all I have. So, like, I'm not seeing school events and everything yet. Okay. You got so June sixth, we have a meeting. We do. Yes. And we're June not 6th. doing the, um, the the stuff that day. I think we were either going to do it at the board meeting or at the work session. Like no. I like to do my my own opinion is I think we should do the honoree and then Separate. have the board meeting. Mm -hmm. I hate having it during the board meeting. I think we did a great job last year of yes. having the environment set right. up. Um, that was great. Mm -hmm. But is there a reason it can't all just be done that day and? Make can sure we just we do we ask for we yeah, we ask for some presentations and we just don't have enough time in our calendar to fill all those spots okay. for the presentations we asked for. Like the grant writer is another one that I think doesn't have a home yet. And so you can look it at does. our presentation schedule which is in there. Would yeah, there so be it is. It's okay. in our schedule. just for again discussion purposes, would there be time earlier in the year that we can do a work session and do some presentations? Sure, Instead I guess of, so. I'm just asking. Yeah. Like instead of trying so. to crowbar it into the end of the year when it's crazy and hot, it is and crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I, you know, would well, there we be something? We did have two board meetings last year in June, so yeah, we had we two board, board meetings board. a lot last year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we did. <laughs> Actually, the school climate survey from Jimmy Cass's Young and Right and Top Ten Students were some of the um, were some of the presentations that kind of couldn't get squeezed. I, in. I would say the Top Ten Students. That's probably their their busiest time of the year. Okay. Right. In June. Can we do that like shortly? Okay. I mean, the town board already recognized the top ten students, yeah, and mean, we haven't yet. You've done a great and job with this consent agenda of yeah. buying us some time too. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe we could put that into the May. Okay. You know, right. it won't take long to recognize our kiddos. Yeah. Or even sooner well, we'll than just that. Do I would sooner than before May. they get yeah. busy. True. Yeah. You know, with college and everything yeah. else. Maybe we can do it back in well, March or April. And, and the yeah. closer you get, like if you give them a little bit, you'll 
Right. Kids will probably know where they're going to school and they'll have mm -hmm. more to talk to us about. Maybe too. April for that. Okay, so we're thinking about adding another April day or just um, not adding I'm another work session at all? <laughs> no? Well, all right. We can continue this conversation then. I think that at this time I'll have a little conversation with Nicole and Mr. Vice and we'll get back to it. We'll yeah. like send an email mm -hmm. yeah. with some suggestions. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, the other thing was the chain of command document. There were some edits to it, and I think it looks good. I hope you've all had an opportunity mm -hmm. to read through it. I think it looks nice. We can add that to the section, um, you know, add that as a link on our Board of Ed section. So does anyone have any questions or suggestions, or are they okay with the... Uh, can't find it this moment, but are they okay with Are you guys okay, okay mm -hmm. with that? I think it's all very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I like it in general. Um, I don't know, the, the last paragraph about the whole, if you're still not solved by then, just mm -hmm. go to come to the Board of Ed meeting. Yeah. Personally, I mean, my response would just be back to Matt. And you, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't yeah. know that, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't mind it being there, but I also don't know that I, I care, I, I would be upset if it wasn't there. Um, okay. I, I think people contact us no matter what. I don't mind, I like talking to people. Yeah. And everything I've dealt with so far, I've been able to find the correct path with them. Um, I don't think I've ever been, you know, reprimanded for doing it wrong um, of recent, you know, in the last several years. I think you're doing a pretty good job of it. I just, I think it, that, I don't know, I mean, I would almost maybe even change it to say at any point, feel free to attend a board meeting or something. I don't know that. Okay. Uh, the, just the way it reads right now is okay. If you're if you're not happy with everyone else, then you can come here. When I don't know if it's gotten that far, that I even wanna. I'd like to, you know, I, I'd like to think that the process, like, I don't know. I just. <laughs> I, I, I mean, understand. I understand your point. Yeah. Thank I you. think I really the need idea... an interpreter to sit next to me. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> I think the the reasoning behind this was to not jump steps. Yes. Yes. You yeah, know, right. if you have an issue with you know your student athlete you know, or your, your child who's an I, athlete and I playing think it's great. Time, I would just, instead of coming straight to the board, yes. mm -hmm. I do understand that there, you know, we have public discussion and they are welcome to come to a board meeting at any time, but it, we always have to defer to the steps anyways. Right. And so that's, it's in writing now. That's yeah. what I mean. I was just thinking, I was just thinking about the last part with it saying like, if you followed all the steps, yes. and then because okay. basically if someone, you know, say came with the issue and they're not happy with it, what are we doing? We're going to circle back to the steps anyway and try well, to figure going, out yeah we're going to make sure that the steps were followed though yes and then it comes to us as a yeah, yes of course we are the last line of communication mm -hmm. we are yeah so all right but we can i can work on tweaking just, it and just throwing you. just giving my opinion on it i don't know what I the rest of the board it's a, feels it's a framework too yeah. i mean I, I think that there may be times that somebody says I, I really need to talk to you know the building principal first or i really need to talk to the superintendent or whatever it is i mean but I think at least it's something, it's, inform, it's informative, it's informational, it's something you can point at. So I, I understand your point too, just my two cents is, you know, this is at least something to say, hey, geez, you know, probably should contact the building principal first before you, before you reach out to, you know, straight to Ed or, or whatever. So, mm -hmm. and I also like too how you said you haven't been reprimanded as of recent on that, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jan was giving me the side eye yeah. so, for my <laughs> early years. Just throwing that out there. So. We won't that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and again, everything... It's something when, nice to point back to, though. Right. A lot of times yeah. people just reach out, say, to one of us because we're the, mo we're the easiest to get a hold of, too. And then it's nice to help them find, find the right answers. And most of the time, it's, a lot of times it's just being heard. Yeah. Like, hey, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. So I'm not... I mean, yeah, I love the whole thing. I, I was just thinking... You know, to um, keep us like you know, to keep the opportunity for people to reach us out more open. I guess. Yeah, I was also thinking of leaving it off the actual published okay. chart because we're here mm -hmm. and it's we're right. always here. Like you know, okay. just again, just giving my two cents. But right. I support it no matter what we do. Okay, thank either you. way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think the one other thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, somebody wanted to talk. Uh, I th I think Vince, you wanted to talk a little bit about academic scholarships and. Mm. Oh, yeah. Them. I added this to the, oh. if you want to say well, a few words about yeah, that. The, the yeah, the conversation we about came it. up yeah. about, you know, balancing um, some of, or highlighting some of our students who uh, get merit scholarships and that. I, I want to say, first off, that this district does a fantastic job of recognizing students. The Students of Excellence is, is a phenomenal program. 
Um, I think the conversation came up about, you know, we have a scholarship night, and, and that's lovely, and we have very generous community that provides scholarships to kids, but there's a lot of kids that also get merit scholarships from colleges that, you know, are... Magnificent. Yeah, $120,000, yeah. 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 you know, that, that may want to be publicized. And I think it's publicized not just for the individual kid or the parents so they can put it on Facebook and feel really good about themselves. It's about the whole organization. Yeah. That mm -hmm. you helped shepherd this child to this place to go to this school and yeah. be recognized as a kid that was highly, highly touted and obviously valuable to mm -hmm. that. So that's it. I think that's, you know, yeah. something that might be able to be um, worked in with the scholarship night or what have you. Yeah. Um, Give attaboys to the kids that are doing well, getting good schools and get a lot of scholarship yeah. money because yeah. of their academics. I think we need to highlight that more than what we do. Yeah. Can I just throw something out there? I, I just I kind of followed some of the communication thread. Uh, so Ellen is actually already working with the top ten from each district mm -hmm. to do a little, little bio, but she also, I, I forwarded the most recent kind of thread just to say, hey, I know there's another district or two that was doing some creative things, so she's already reached out to those districts oh, to, to get some samples of the stuff that they're doing. Uh, she said she is not above stealing from other school districts yeah. if they've come up with a good idea mm -hmm. for how to they recognize kids. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I know of, I know of a few kids that are, you know, maybe not necessarily top 10, but they're, they're decent kids and mm -hmm. they've got scholarships yep. um, well into the 80, 90, $100,000 scholarships. Mm -hmm. I would have never known that that was even a possibility. Yeah. I thought scholarships were like two grand, five grand. So like when I hear about that, I'm like, wow, how come we didn't? <clears throat> Well, that's when they did have scholarships like that. We're in college, but college only cost <laughs> yeah. five dollars. Yeah. yeah, not right. Yeah. Not a hundred grand. Yeah. Um, you know, I just it's, I know like when kids, I don't want to say sign with athletic. Like I know we do the thing like that, but it's kind of cool. It'd be kind of cool to see that yeah. with some of the kids for the academics. Um, and then you know, I'm assuming there's even other stuff that I'm not even thinking about whether they, get, you know, like I mean, how many times has a kid you know, musical program going on with a scholarship somewhere, or how many times is, you know... Our academy, our academy mm -hmm. students. Yeah, our academy mm -hmm. students, like, I mean, just again, seeing a lot of the stuff other than just playing, you know, and I'm not demeaning, because I could never play football the way some of these, or one of the sports, but, you know, I mean, um, in fact, we, we would hear, um, you know, you have the, like, the signing, not this, or there's a signing, but there's, I hear about other stories about how successful some of the kids are. And that goes back to all my tracking of alumni too. Yeah, um, national right there. national technical honor society just uh, inducted some some of our students, a good good number of our mm -hmm. students, uh, on east and west side, probably seven on east side. So, yeah, those are kids that definitely should be brought in this room and mm -hmm. and congratulated like yeah. to inspire others to follow that path. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I think putting it on social media is is important because everybody seems to share it, and that's where people get their. Yeah. I'm really from? impressed with what our, our district does the graduation with the kids who do the military. Mm -hmm. But I don't really hear anything like previous to that. Like at some point when they sign to go in the military, maybe we get those mm -hmm. kids together. Right. Um, I'm really impressed signing. with how we recognize those kids. Mm -hmm. What I would maybe recommend then, I just and I think I already have some some ideas to work on, but just what are the areas that kids get recognized for? So maybe it's just kind of a list of things, and then just because you're right, it's not always the kid that's got the 99.999 average at the end mm -hmm. it's sometimes it's kids that you know grind your way and you know and maybe the, the grades are good but they're not stellar but yet they're being recognized for something else right. i know when students of excellence first started sometimes the kids you know would, would you know it wasn't the academics that they were necessarily being recommended mm -hmm. for it's other areas of functioning so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where i think the students of excellence is a, a really good program yeah. Yeah. it's a a program that other schools should be stealing from us because you are recognizing kids that are doing great community things in the community, starting their own businesses, um, so on and so forth. So I say that's great. I think we can probably do a little bit more too, though. Mm -hmm. yep. Agreed. Well. Agreed. That sounds good. Great. All right. Um, would anyone else like to offer any discussion while you have the floor? I did have a couple. I just wanted to know if we were going to um, make public that we're putting TOSAs in place for our, at our elementary schools. And I had a couple questions regarding that. So. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I'm, it's not a secret, definitely. So you know, we've worked uh, at our elementary buildings. It was identified that uh, some of our folks, our administrators, need some additional support to be instructional leaders in the buildings. So we had some extensive meetings uh, you know, with the elementary principals about that, actually received some information and feedback from our elementary uh, teachers as well, uh, really just kind of corroborating that, you know, things are really, you know, kind of been a little busy since COVID hit and you were trying to get back to the uh, uh, sense of normal and calmness in the buildings. Uh, so we worked over the past probably month or so to identify people. There was a posting that went out there uh, for people that were interested in being a TOSA. TOSA stands for Teacher on Special Assignment. Uh, our tech integrators are TOSAs. Um, I was actually a TOSA in this building at one point. Um, but basically they're, they're serving to help maybe in some cases facilitate things like the response to intervention process in a building. Um, building principals, especially at the elementary level, don't have a whole lot of infrastructure. They just don't. Uh, in terms of additional support. Um, they don't you know, they have a social worker, they'll have a psychologist assigned to them. Uh, there is a counselor that travels between the buildings, uh, but in many cases there may be a student that might be struggling with something. In addition to helping to move forward, maybe like the RTI process, a student might be struggling with something uh, that requires maybe some conversation with parents uh, or other resources in the child's life to be able to help them manage and navigate through that. Something like that at times can tie up a building principal for a significant period of time, which is pulling them away from doing things like along those lines of being instructional leaders uh, or trying to address other issues that might require, whether it's discipline or whatever. So Artosa's stepping in. We've used this model before in the past uh, and it's been effective, but Artosa's being able to step in. So we've identified five people for the five elementaries being able to step in and support uh, our administrators in the school and the school uh, as a whole. So this is a pilot just for the rest of this year is what we've looked at. So at this point, we've identified the folks and uh, we're in the process of looking to be able to backfill those positions. So uh, at this point, uh, they haven't actually started assuming any of those responsibilities yet because we want to make sure we don't pull out the ladder with uh, you know, some another support in place. Mm -hmm. Do we have to wait to hire the replacements before they are going to active duty? It's a good question. The building principals have been working on that. In some cases, you might already have like a like a preferred building sub or somebody that might already currently be in place in the district. In other cases, one of the individuals is a speech path, so we have to be able to identify somebody to be able to step in for him. He's got a caseload, and you can't just right. pull that out. So. Yeah, we're, I guess in answer to your question, we don't want to pull out a support without, you know, having another support in place. So, and there was a level of thought that went into that too in terms of assigning folks to this too, you know, building principals being able to say, yeah, I, I, I think I have a plan for transitioning this person into this role and having somebody else come into that role. So, okay. All right. So. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to say, um, Ed, Vince, and I were at the facilities meeting, mm -hmm. um, committee meeting yesterday, and it's looking at our buildings, what needs to be done in the buildings, what can wait to be done, what's critical, looking forward to possibly doing another capital improvement project along the way. So just looking at some of those, so that's, yeah. that was a very interesting meeting. It, it's, and I appreciate you being there, honestly. It's a little different of a process than maybe we've used in the past, mm -hmm. but just having people, and again, there's, you know, there, there, there were some teachers over there. We had some folks from CSEA, yeah. just, just trying to have some discussion about what a capital process, what is entailed in a capital process. Um, you know, we looked at the element, sort of look globally, then we looked at the elementaries. Mm -hmm. The last time, this time was the middle schools, the next time will be the high schools, and after that, we're really looking to be able to, you know, some things are kind of rising to the surface. And it's based on need. You start with what needs to be replaced. And univents need to be replaced, all right? So, I mean, just that's our air, air handling systems. That's a, that's a definite thing that I think we're going to have to address. So, it's having conversations, you know. Yeah. I, I think yeah. the process is great. I think that we need to be ready for another project. Mm -hmm. When you kick cans down the road, you end up paying a price. And yeah. we know that the years that there wasn't capital improvement yeah. project yeah. going, came at a cost that when it came time to make all these repairs things were much more expensive and the lift was far heavier so yeah. I think it's a good process now to be ready for mm -hmm. that next project to see where I'm, the needs are going to be yeah yeah Bruce I just have to clarify I, you know I was joking with Franco about failing algebra because <laughs> I majored in math and oh, music. I, <laughs> no, I, I posted school. on Facebook that you did. I know you did. That's <laughs> <laughs> official. That's what I get for knowing you since like you were a little kid. Don't worry. <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, that's brain compatible learning. Uh, music and math are related. 
yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, the yeah. sections of the brain, yeah. So, and I did pass. I, I never Barely. doubted you did. Yeah. Barely. <laughs> Barely. Stop it. Well, I mean, All you right. had the little chalkboard with a piece of chalk. Okay. Is there anything else? We gotta get kids. Yeah. We gotta go. All right. Um, yeah, I do want to go. I would ask that, make a motion to move into executive session to discuss uh, particular individuals and employment history. All right. Can he? I'll second. All in favor? All right. Do we just need a motion and a second? Oh, yeah. I, I can do it tonight. I, I ran out of time. All right. Uh, all in favor of going Aye. into executive? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll take a five minute recess. Papers. Oh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, we're going to take a five-minute recess, and then we will be closing the meeting. Yeah.